Welcome to Shaman's Shed. Today I'm talking with Dr. James Cook. He is a neuroscientist, lecturer and writer who specialises in consciousness and psychedelic science. He has studied experimental psychology at Oxford University, and this is where he also undertook his PhD in neuroscience. He is the host of podcast Living Mirrors, and currently works and researches at University College London. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. James Cook to Shaman's Shed. Yeah, so I guess I really want to start with um, finding out, you know, about yourself and uh, your your academic background and your area of research. Yeah, um, so my my kind of deep background is is um, that as a teenager I had a kind of strange, a pretty kind of um, classic mystical experience, kind of loss of sense of self, immersion in the present moment, um, feeling that just kind of suddenly dropping into reality being this kind of imminent and like just awe-inspiring thing that like um, it's hard to put into words but but that happened when I was about 13 and then from that point on I didn't really have any doubts that I was going to spend the rest of my life thinking about kind of what a, different aspects of this thing and psychology obviously made sense coming from a western western context so um, I studied experimental psychology at Oxford University considered doing philosophy and psychology but um ended up just kind of plumbing for experimental psychology which is the very kind of hard science version <clears throat> so much to the disappointment a lot of to a lot of people um who arrived thinking they were going to be studying freud and dreams and stuff like that it was all very much like uh how does memory work how does perception work controlled ex everything had to be based in controlled experiments um and i turned out that i loved it i i went in with a kind of an interest in consciousness and all this stuff that's you know harder to pin down experimentally um and to be honest within about a week of studying like hard like neurophysiology like how the how circuits in the retina extract information that kind of thing i was just blown away like it was just so i've always been fascinated by evolution and seeing the kind of the way that circuits in the retina mirrored certain kind of engineering discoveries that people have, have kind of used in lots of different capacities and just seeing how evolution had kind of grown these circuits that could do these really elegant procedures that just really blew me away. So I, I kind of ended up um, being fascinated by what's called the cortex, this kind of outer wrinkly surface of the brain, which you might think is the whole brain if you just look at a brain, um, but there's a lot underneath subcortical structures. But the cortex was fascinating to me because it's kind of circuitry is the same everywhere, like in the visual part and the bit that does hearing and bits that do decision making and movement. Um, but so I was like, there's something that really appealed to me. I was like, there's, there's got to be some fundamental principle here as to what's going on in the cortical circuitry that allows it to be this kind of general purpose processor. Um, so that was what I did my PhD in was actually in auditory neuroscience because uh, music was my passion during my, uh, well, it still is my passion, but, um, especially during my teenage years. Um, and it, yeah, so it never left me. And so I decided sound was a great modality to play around with. And um, yeah, so that, so I um, I was I was kind of looking at trying to crack some kind of we use the term canonical for like um, aspects that kind of apply across different modalities. So I was looking for kind of canonical circuit um, dynamics and features that might account for, for aspects of conscious perception. Um, and then now I'm a research scientist at UCL, so that was all Oxford. Now I'm at UCL. Um, and I kind I continue to do that, but I've also the lab I'm in specializes in memory and and kind of dreaming and the role of sleep in what's called memory consolidation. So taking experiences and storing transferring to memories. So now I, I guess I have neuroscientifically I have a kind of overview of perception and memory, all, all this stuff that kind of gives us an experience of being who we are and being in this world. Um, and in the kind of midst of that journey of doing hard science, I guess it was just maybe a year and a half ago now but I, I kind of I was always keeping abreast of the consciousness research even though I wasn't doing experimental consciousness research or anything like that I was I was doing related things perception um but I I think I I had a meditation practice and I think I thought I think I thought that consciousness was just always going to be a mystery I thought it was just a bit, a bit like trying to intuitively understand certain aspects of quantum mechanics I thought perhaps our brains just aren't kind of you know equipped to do this there's nothing 
there's nothing in the laws of nature that says naked monkeys should be able to <laughs> understand every aspect of themselves, right? So, so I thought consciousness was this fascinating thing I could explore um, through meditation and I could understand the physical side of things in the, in the brain, but you were never going to be able to jump that divide. And, um, and I just, I, yeah, one day I just had an idea that kind of, that for me worked in terms of trying to understand how they relate to each other. And so that's now, it's coming out in a couple of weeks now in general consciousness studies, this theory called the living mirror theory, which um, for me, yeah, what it took me from thinking this was an un insoluble mystery to thinking this makes sense. Um, so that's, that's kind of something I do al alongside the experimental work because that's theoretical. Um, yeah, so that kind of brings me up to present day, I guess. So at what point um, for you, because obviously, you know, I've seen your your YouTube the about your spirit your sort of spiritual awakening. You know, you, you've obviously got a very sort of rational and scientific approach, but also, you know, you, you're considering the irrational element of consciousness and spirituality. At what point did you think about looking at the irrational? Because that's something, you know, most of us don't want to look at and and don't understand we sort of once we experience something irrational we rationalize it afterwards and put it back in its place mm -hmm. how, how how did that yeah. happen to you especially from having such a you know solid academic background and yeah i think uh, it, i guess there are a few different kinds of irrationality we could talk about you know there's 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 stuff that really just doesn't seem to add up and it's kind of paradoxical that one might encounter with psychedelics or something, which is which is its own category. But if we're talking about things that are beyond rationality, you, we might say a rational rather than irrational. You know, like it's because most people I think if you hear irrational, you think oh, it's just it's wrong and incorrect. Yeah. But the reason you might meditate when you're meditating, you're not using your rational mind. You're trying to kind of intuitively apprehend kind of what's going on. And actually, studying neuroscience, there's it seems a, a bit of a mystery to, to contemporary neuroscience that half of the neurons in the brain are in this small bit called the cerebellum, which is at the back. And um, modern neuroscience doesn't seem to know what to make of that. But to me, it makes sense because that there's a, a theory that the cerebellum is involved in intuition. And so I think a lot of our mind is kind of, is actually this kind of intuitive apprehending of things that you can't quite put into words. But, you know, like when you see red, when you see the color red, you, you just know it's red. You don't need so you don't need to say to yourself, I am looking at the color red or like there's you can't even imagine what it would be like to rationally see red because it's such an irrational process it just happens you just yeah, intuitively yeah. get it right um so yeah bit off topic um from your question but um so i i think with that that kind of perspective the the kind of this like a mystical experience spiritual awakening thing that happened when i was like 13 i wish there was better what terms for it because i mean you i think no terms really kind of sum up what it what it is but it happened because I think I was f far over on the stuck in my rational kind of head like too much. So I, it was, I think it came out of analyzing it from where I'm at now. What I was dealing with was, was being raised Catholic and this kind of guilt ridden, trying to figure out the dogma of like how I could like, it was specifically about like, if having blind faith and I was like I can't have blind faith because I, even at that age I was like a very kind of evidence-based uh I guess like rationalist and um I was like I can't have blind faith all these adults are telling me I have to have blind faith otherwise I'm going to be tortured by infinity by a benevolent god who made me this way made me not having blind faith but he says I have to have blind faith and so then you just go in a loop and you just kind of I just couldn't it just made zero sense but I, I just went around and around and around I now understand that I was also dealing with a lot of trauma and like just kind of fairly standard childhoods, you know, difficult experiences that a lot of people go through. But I, it, it all kind of came to a head and I was just in a, in a very emotionally worked up state, just sitting on a bus like you wouldn't have known it to look at me, just listening to music. Um, and I think what happened is kind of, I guess, neurophysiologically is that process just kind of ran out of steam. It may have even just been metabolically like that those parts of the brain were going so much they may have just given up but it, it also might have just been like you know my my mind got that it wasn't it, I wasn't there was no way out I was truly trapped and so after however many minutes you know of, of doing this or maybe hours who knows how long it, this has been going around in my head um that that side of me just collapsed which, which was the side of me the only side of me I knew 
and then suddenly I uh, yeah I just kind of looked out the window and it was just utterly still and silent and my mind was silent and like nothing changed in my visual appearance apart from suddenly everything just looked like utterly fresh and kind of pristine and and I, and I was perceiving you know everything just seemed so clear and there was just no mental chatter and and it was this you know it's the kind of thing that's attested to well in Buddhism which is that if you do just sink into the present moment and you're not distracted in thoughts clinging on to like oh I wonder if I can like have have that in the future or oh I wish I hadn't made that mistake in the past if you just sink in it's like it's categorically fully liberating from any form of suffering and so that's why I was just overcome by this sense of bliss and this feeling that like everything is ultimately okay in the universe like if you can just pay attention to the present moment there is no suffering even you know we see this with the monks who set themselves on fire in protest they clearly knew that like they could even transcend that by just paying attention through meditating and so to me I was like wow like, this is you know a powerful powerful thing um and so but that experience was wasn't rational it was just seeing it was apprehending something seeing something intuiting something in an instant um but it made complete sense in term it like zero nothing about it was supernatural so i was and and that's the thing in an instant i went from someone who had spent years in deep distress feeling like I needed to be Christian and worried about all this dogma and then for never for a second the rest of my life did I worry about it for a second more because what I realized to try and put into words was when you kind of when you stop thinking and conceptualizing and you just are present suddenly you realize that reality just is it's all just here being and it's beyond what you say about it people can think different things you can say different things about it and so I kind of intuitively was like, oh, like all this stuff I'm getting worked up about, it's just people saying stuff. It's just <laughs> generation after generation, people say things. They say, oh, you better watch out. God will get you if you don't do what I say. And I was like, oh, it's like so simple and obvious. And I've like, I've got all worked up about nothing, about ideas. Um, so so then I, I, yeah, that was when I was like, okay, like I I don't see this being spoken about in, in our culture. I And where I did see it spoken about was was in the spirituality section, which I was kind of, I guess I just intuitively grew to feel was like not where serious intellectual work was, you know, like to me that was like not, I, I think this is ridiculous now. And I think it's a pathology of the culture that we've managed to to try and other anything spiritual and to do with, with meaning. Um, but at that time, you know, it's probably a pretty common thing being kind of English and, you know, yeah. a man, it's not something you're kind of encouraged to, to look into. So. So that's kind of why part of me did think I should go and join a monastery and just be like, I should cultivate this for the rest of my life. And I, I looked into it, but turned out as like a 17 year old, I couldn't really get to Tibet. And I went to Nepal for a bit, which was my <laughs> my attempt to do that. But um, but I, uh, so yeah, so that was, I, I instead decided to go down the kind of science path and was exhilarated at every stage to see that everything I was learning about the brain and about biology fitted with this experience. Nothing contradicted it. And again and again, you would, you know, you'd have these baffled lecturers saying things like, yeah, like there's no CEO in the brain. There's no, there's no part of the brain that's the puppeteer that, co that controls all the other bits, like, and saying it with a sense of like, how weird is that? But to me, it would just made utter, utter sense that we are, there's just this reality is this kind of process and we're these like distributed systems that just kind of come into existence. And we're not really this story we tell ourselves in the head that we're like in control of, of this, this body. So, um, so I guess it came in at the beginning, um, the kind of irrational stuff. I think what's what's really really interesting about what you said there, sort of right at the beginning about about trauma. Um, I think that's something that really gets sort of hidden away in society um, because you know I completely resonate Definitely. with that. Um, it's almost like the trauma, you know, I, I have no problem saying that in my sort of early 20s, I was a, a very egotistical, um, competitive, uh, you know, got to be the best. And it, it, it didn't do me very well. It, you know, it may cause bad relationships. It got me in trouble. And, I, you know, that was almost caused, brought me to a point where um, I was backed into a corner and my I almost had a essentially a forced ego death because you know it, it that egotistical part of me got me in trouble with family and you know 
um, people around me because I was just in a you know a, a poor set of belief patterns, uh, thought patterns and beliefs. Um, and it's like the trauma is like you say it kind of knocks those thought patterns and those old records that are going it knocks you out of that um and uh i think that's that, yeah, that's what's really interesting about this whole sort of movement at the moment is that it's those moments of suffering that that bring us to you know cathartic those cathartic moments and make us more aware yeah. and actually bring us into the present moment which you know sounds to some people quite scary because you know you don't nobody wants to nobody wants to suffer to suddenly wake up and you know like you say that moment you had and you sort of looked around you um i i I think it is one of those consciousness awakening moments and it's kind of dusted over and i I think that's kind of a it also brings you know like you say the irrational it brings that that part into it because you don't consider those things while you're stuck in a very rigid you know set of thinking so i think that's you know really interesting that you you've you've brought that to the to the forefront um because a lot of people aren't you know brave enough to really want to talk about those those issues and and trauma um but, but yeah, yeah i mean the um the for me it's it's interesting because i think it was it, i guess there's kind of two parts to the, to my story which is everything i've said so far and then towards the end of my 20s was through um, following the kind of research with psilocybin from you know the active compound of magic mushrooms for that they can occasion mystical experiences uh, that caught my attention because um, I, I I felt like this was the most valuable thing that ever happened to me but I barely spoke about it to anyone and because I knew I couldn't really it is an experience so I couldn't really com- convey it to, to someone if they hadn't had it and but I thought this would be good for humanity if more people could have these experiences and so I took an interest in that um, and also, once I started doing that, I became interested in microdosing because I was having kind of seasonal bouts of depression, which I attributed to the lack of sunlight in uh, living in Britain um, in winter. And then, so so as very much as a kind of, as part of my intellectual life, I decided to experiment with the kind of high dose psilocybin, but then also therapeutically with the microdoses. And very quickly, it just started kind of getting to work on me and 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 releasing yeah producing kind of emotional catharsis releasing traumas that i really should have known were there like i knew these things had happened it would and it would have seemed implausible that they that it left me unscathed but we live in a culture that's just so this narrative just isn't taught to us we're not we're not taught that like challenging things happen if you don't actively try and engage with them your shadow side and heal it you probably will feel depressed and overwhelmed and you know you might end up kind of overeating being addicted to things and this once you you kind of see how this all works it's so obvious but it's amazing how much our culture doesn't think this way and it just i guess because there's enough collective trauma that everyone would rather just sit on top of it and be like don't talk about it don't look at it don't you know let's not kind of ruffle the feathers um but yeah so so for me this is partly why i now kind of am evangelical about psychedelics which is it's there's something you know it's almost two two sides of this thing that you've got the kind of spiritual stuff but then there's the healing stuff um they are deeply interrelated but for me it's almost two sides of this story because i think i think the the kind of spiritual experiences i had before that point even though i saw them as healthy and saw them as as genuine insights into the nature of the mind i think they were precipitated by trauma they were they were precipitated by being pushed into being disembodied overly identified with consciousness and now thanks to psychedelic medicine, I can be far more embodied and still access those conscious states. But but yeah, the, the whole range is available. Instead of, instead of having an unhappy ego that I can escape from, I now have a kind of relatively happy ego that I can, I can yeah. choose with you know, how much I want to identify with it. So, you know, t- talking about ego and, you know, shadow sort of, part of the self you know there's loads of sort of different philosophies you know ahamkara you know that they talk about you know veils to brahman uh, and oneness how how do you see the ego because this is something i've I talked to people a lot about and it'd be interesting to get your sort of perspective because some people are you know 
go from a, a sort of Jungian, you know, Jungian side to it and think it's something that needs to be integrated and the reins need to be taken control of it to detach from it and see it as something separate. But also, you know, there's there's other sort of sectors of Buddhism and Hinduism that may say that it's a complete illusion um, that that will, you know, dissipate. And once you've negated it completely and you find that tranquility and, you know, meditation, it will disappear. How, how do you view that from a spiritual sort of perspective and a, and a scientific perspective? Because it's... Yeah. Yeah, they're uh, definitely the same perspective for me. I think they're sufficiently integrated that, <laughs> that I only have really one perspective on this. Um, and so, yeah, I guess it's a really interesting question. It may, I may have to kind of come at it from a few different angles because it's it's obviously not trivial. <laughs> um, yeah, no. Uh, but that's what makes it interesting. Um, so I guess the there are a few different things we can call the self, which can make, or the ego, which can make this kind of... Um, complicated you know so you've got the organism which i think does exist you know there are people who take these kind of consciousness only ontologies where they think that that all of reality is consciousness that's not my my take i think physical organisms do exist and so i am you could you could point to that and say that's a self compared you know differentiates me from you but as soon as you start to think about what you mean when you say yourself or your identity or your ego you realize that's not really what you're talking about you know you feel you feel more like you're in your head than you feel like you are your toenails or something, right? Like there's a, you feel like you're kind of inhabiting this body. So there's this, there's this psychological self. So there's, there's that. Um, and it's, it's confusing because the psychological self um, is a concept that, that maps onto a bunch of different things, but the body is one big part of it. So it says, this is my body as opposed to your body is not my body. Uh, but then it also says, those things that happened to me yesterday are my experiences and my intentions for the future. So all of that gets woven together into this single thing we call a self. And it, I mean, maybe even just saying that people can kind of get the intuition that like, there's no way that can be a single thing that can't, that's, that's a bunch of different processes. You know, there's perception of my body, there's imagining the future, there's remembering the past. And so with this complex organism that weaves together all these different cognitive processes into this, and we say that there's a self it actually doesn't ever really get woven together into a self this is what it is i think you know there's a lot of books now saying this kind of link between buddhism and neuroscience because everyone's agreeing basically that the buddhists would say that the self isn't what it seems perhaps it's an illusion it's you know i think that's a good way of saying it because there's something we're, we're pointing to when we say the, the psychological self but um it's not uh it's not what, what we think it is you know there's not there's not a, a solid unity of james inside me that's like a soul that can survive death you know that's the thing that's sure. an illusion um from the buddhist perspective and then from the neuroscience perspective yeah there's no way you could find something like that um but the psychological processes do exist and so for me i think if you'd asked me in the past i might have said that the self was an illusion to be transcended. And if you identify with just being, you can kind of move past this, this kind of somewhat false sense of separation. But but what I what I would say now is um there's there's this thing in Buddhism called the doctrine of two truths, which is which is very related to my scientific way of viewing these things, which is that you've got absolute truth, which is just everything exists. It's all one in that sense. Like if you if that's all you say, it's like there is existence and you identify with existence, then that's it. Like, and this is the thing you can't really put into words, but that's kind of the mystical experience. It's just like you could just say is, like, um, and then that's that's it. But there are patterns, and I am a kind of pattern that's differentiated from you. These psychological patterns do exist. And so relatively, relative to other things, um, there are structures, there are patterns that exist. So the ego does exist in a relative sense um and that's a fine way to exist so you can say it does exist um but it doesn't exist in some absolute sense which is how we tend to tend to think of it um and because of my personal kind of journey i've i've also i think i now believe that enlightenment isn't like a state that people should be striving for to exist in a state where they've dropped their sense of self i think um that you know i'm talking very much from my own personal experience, but I suspect it applies to other people that that desire comes from unconscious trauma and issues and actually kind of glimpsing that, seeing, knowing how to move in that direction when necessary, kind of mastering your mind, but tending to live your life as an embodied 
creature that has its own sense of self and that's fine it helps it navigate the world um but it doesn't take it too seriously you know it doesn't um yeah doesn't kind of grip onto it unconsciously in this tight way that causes lots of unnecessary suffering um so yeah i'm not sure if that that answers the question but no, that's definitely. my vibe De on it definitely and it's interesting as well because like you said it's not seeking enlightenment is in itself a form of grasping at something isn't it you know mm -hmm. so like you say it it's probably unlike that that seeking is it's it's should it's really just that acceptance of being and being in the presence and not sort of that's that's kind of enlightenment that sense of being it doesn't matter what's going on around it's it's you know the ap application of thoughts which you know which change that and seeking enlightenment is an application of a thought isn't it and a desire um in yeah. itself so so yeah um i think the other like interesting thing about sort of hearing you talk about these things uh, you know ego and um certain philosophies and buddhism um you know i personally i i i'd read a lot of vedanta um that's kind of one of my one of the philosophies that sort of rescued me and brought me into meditation before i went into plant med, uh, plant medicine um but what what i find sort of interesting is is also there's this there's this really subtle la language barrier as well in terms of people's definitions and perceptions of what these things mean so and even like you know like the word the self there are uh, even across the different philosophy you know there are many subtle differences in which what how they they come across and um it's really hard unless you you know negated all those um signs and symbols and you know when you're in that sort of tranquility of meditation it's really difficult to sometimes to communicate those things with each other and have actually a, a mutual understanding uh, yeah yeah <laughs> Obviously, you've, you're, again, you've come from that, you know, really solid academic background and you've, you know, you've done something really bold in, you know, you're looking at San Pedro and Ayahuasca and psilocybin. Um, you know, what do these, what have these things sort of taught you, again, both scientifically and spiritually? What, what made you turn to them and, and investigate them and what's, what have they done for you, essentially? Yeah, so I think um, psilocybin was yeah was where I began, and um, my my first experience was a kind of heroic dose five dried. It was actually it wasn't five dried grams; it was fifty fresh grams, which is because wow. there's a, <laughs> but it's the same. It's supposed to be the same amount of psilocybin, but because yeah. they're like ninety percent mushrooms, it was an incredibly intense experience. So maybe uh, <laughs> it was misdosed, but um, but that even though obviously a lot happened visually and and experientially it took me very much to the same place that I'd experienced in that mystical experience as a teenager and that I would kind of access with meditation. And um, so, so that was a great confirmation for me that, that this is, we are talking about the same territory. It was quite a privilege, I think, to, to, to have it spontaneously, have it with plants, but with fungi. Um, and then also to have this neuroscientific background, I felt like this was a kind of quite a unique, maybe not entirely unique, but quite a, a rare combination. So that's partly why I wanted to kind of get out into the public and share this stuff um, in case it was helpful. Um, yeah, and then um, let me think, where did I get lead to next? The, yeah, so psilocybin, I felt was, the experiences were, they didn't cause me to question anything about my understanding of reality. Everything seemed to fit entirely with, um, with how I thought about this stuff, you know, the brain generating these, you know, I, I see perception as a kind of controlled hallucination anyway. So it's, uh, it didn't surprise me the brain can create incredible, you know, displays of, of, of visuals. Um, I remember uh, fairly early on having quite a profound experience of, of kind of feeling myself, I was listening to some Irish folk music and I felt myself to bec like becoming a like an, a kind of Irish woman it like, I guess probably like kind of medieval island, just swimming in a river in the countryside and then going back to this village and hanging out with all the women there. And it was, it was a really profound experience because I've always thought of myself as a broadly sensitive kind of guy, but I, I, as soon as that experience started happening, I had this real resistance and I realized that there's a whole 
I, I don't actively explore my kind of feminine side at all. And I was like, oh, there's actually, there's resistance here. That's interesting. So that, that was actually a really powerful um, step in this in kind of opening myself to the concept of healing. Like some part of me, even when I say the word healing now, kind of tightens up, you know, there's, there's still yeah. some part of me that, that does that. So it was important for me to realize I had some blockage there. But my, um, my wife said afterwards, she jokingly said, she was like, oh, maybe it was a past life. And I just, I laughed because I was like zero part of me entertained that as an idea. Um, and then I kind of got more into this work and read the work of Stan Groff, who who seems to quite straightforwardly believe in in past lives. And and I, I deeply respect traditions in Tibetan Buddhism and they have this fairly literal sounding thing on past lives. So as I kind of, I guess I, I started in this and I, I still don't believe, I can't think of any way to make sense of, of that stuff. So that's still not not my take. But I would say as I moved down this path, um, I think it was probably trying DMT, which was the the kind of pure DMT experience, which just kind of knocked my socks off in the most kind of, that's, that's a real understatement. You know, it kind of, it was a, it was a fairly classic kind of breakthrough experience that um, felt like being kind of catapulted into what felt like ultimate reality and, it, and the, the thing that was very strange about it was in an instant I, I felt like I remembered that that's where I came from and that this is kind of like a simulation that we come into um it was it was like it was like there's this place where we all are just forever and ever and it's it's infinitely intense and kind of joyous but in a really manic frantic intense way the energy levels are just so high um, and so we kind of we put on this as like a play. We, it's almost like you can imagine that that's like us in the future. And this is like an ancestor simulation where we're like, oh, remember when there was space to breathe? And before we'd like got into this situation where we're now in this like manic hyped up state. Um, and it was it was very, very strange to feel like I remembered that this was this wasn't real and that was real. Um, and that I'm, I'm glad I'm really glad that happened because again like as i said before like no part of me entertained the idea of like really anything outside of my worldview which was a very kind of strict naturalist scientific worldview it still is but that experience made me kind of think like oh like okay there's a reason people say these things there's a reason people believe in stuff that to me i've never entertained because you know before that point i would say again the brain can create crazy experiences why would you believe anything that's outside of you know Kind of naturalistic scientific worldview but then that experience showed me it was like well it, it just it just thrust into my face the most basic problems of, of philosophy of mind that you can't ever really get out get away from which you know like the problem of solipsism how do i know that you know i'm not the only mind in existence that this isn't a dream that i'm about to wake up from you know really basic kind of you know mm -hmm. premise of the matrix you know stuff yeah, yeah. but it's it, it's not been solved you can't solve that you know it's impossible to it's it's always there as an issue um and so um it really just made me kind of sit and think like huh like you can have experiences that if you're being intellectually serious you you know like what would it, what wouldn't have been intellectually serious would just be to dismiss it and say there's no problem here i'm a scientist it's this is definitely 100 percent the real world and that's definitely a, a drug experience um because it felt like I'd remembered that a, a a situation which in which like this is the simulation and we put we sprinkle DMT through nature as a kind of as just a kind of little cheat code to escape whenever we want <laughs> and and it was like from this perspective that sounds implausible but from that perspective it's like well that's just what happened and how you know like they seemed yeah anyway um <laughs> so so for me intellectually that was a big moment um and then when I did ayahuasca, there was just some similar to psilocybin. There was some really great kind of emotional catharsis insight stuff um, to do with kind of early life. But there was also it kind of took me back to the to the pure DMT experience, which I found unnerving because um, because I with psilocybin, I so I, I've never had like a kind of a bad trip because I think I. Oh. I think I went in with such a strong worldview of this is all in my mind that I knew how to surrender to it. I knew there was nothing to fear of my own mental activity. Once the after the DMT thing, the ayahuasca experience, you know, you suddenly you have these entities coming at you and seemingly these aliens operating on your body. And like this, 
and it's it's happening as as real as anything, as real as you know us talking right now, and and you're just it's going on, and and I I remember just thinking like experientially the, this really feels like this is happening to me and it's something that exists outside of me and if that i mean if that was the case then i would not have control over it how you know say these were real interdimensional <laughs> entities of disembodied things how do i know they don't they're not going to do something harmful to me you know I, I can no longer trust and fully surrender um so that i i returned to psilocybin after that and for the first time had this feeling of being not being fully at ease, being having that lingering worry of like, like I can't one hundred percent discount the the fact that you know so many human societies have believed in immaterial spirits, and when you start to go on the kind of plant medicine path, you realize how how much wet the Western mode has been like. Everyone look over here, keep your head down, do your job, like you know, like, and then suddenly you try DMT and you're like, why, how has this been kept from us? Like how, you know, or even just mushrooms, right? The healing power of mushrooms, you're like, okay, this, this culture is pathological in the, in that it's keeping us looking away from things. So who knows, you know, there is, for me, there was this feeling of like, well, who knows how, you know, deep the rabbit hole goes, maybe indigenous cultures that, that believe in kind of literal spirits are, are just literally correct. And we've somehow, you know, convinced ourselves otherwise. Um, so that's ultimately I, I you know i i'm now kind of i would say back to i feel like i guess like 95 percent confident in like a kind of naturalistic scientific worldview in which this is all being generated by the brain um but i've gone from 99.9 percent .9 to 95 percent which is a you know a big okay. uh, a significant chink in the armor i think of, of that of that worldview um yeah and then the the san pedro um I'd also did a lot of, of of kind of healing work with LSD, and they were very similar. Um, I think because they're both so, you know, you have tryptamines like DMT and and psilocybin, which are more like serotonin physically, the molecule, and then you have phenethylamines, which are more like dopamine. They still act on serotonin, but they have a bit of kind of cross activity with dopamine. And mescaline's a phenethylamine. LSD is somewhere in between. And so I think with LSD and mescaline, I experience you experience this far more kind of. I shouldn't say for everyone, but for me, a far more bodily, kind of buzzy, almost excited feeling, which I found really unlocked kind of bodily kind of trauma memories. So like, you know, in there's this whole field of somatic psychology and um, somatic experiencing and body based psychotherapy. And and before these experiences, I just I didn't know what any of that was about until I discovered that your your body really does act like a map indexing all these emotional experiences in your life. Um, and so for me, a gigantic part of my kind of healing work was with those kinds of substances, just kind of almost just doing yoga assisted with them and letting letting my body kind of shake out, tremble out, you know, whatever the emotion is with the experience, you know, cry it out, scream it out, I mean, into a pillow, but um, but like let yourself actually experience these intense emotions that may have associated with memories that you've never let yourself feel. Did you, have you found that being a meditator, that that's given you, um, in, in, when you're using any of any of these plant medicines, it's given you a better level of introspection while you're in the experience? Because obviously you can, in a younger day, someone that goes into these things without any, you know, goes in recreationally, it can be a bit of a disaster. Whereas with the meditation, it gives you a, a bit more of a, you know, control of your mind uh, how, how did you did you, you find that yeah 100 percent. i would say to anyone who's interested in this stuff cultivating a meditation practice before just doing 10 minutes of mindfulness even if it's only for a week leading up to it is such a good preparation because you know if you sit down for 10 minutes and after five minutes your legs are a bit uncomfortable and you're bored but if you just train yourself in that moment to look at the, the contents of your experience and accept it and come back to the present moment that is the skill I think you need. You know, I've never actually taken psychedelics recreationally. They've always been, in the first instance, it was kind of this this kind of psychonautical intellectual curiosity exploration. And then it became this very intentional healing kind of stuff. Um, and so if you're doing that kind of thing, especially if you're doing the, the first kind, the kind of if you're interested in mystical experiences and and that kind of thing, then the to me, the method that I realized I was pursuing unconsciously was 
to kind of lie back, observe the contents of my consciousness and just let it. And so effectively, I was meditating the whole time, or at least I was being deeply mindful the whole time. Um, so, you know, this is it's if you're a beginner, if you're a beginner at something like meditation or mindfulness, if you're thinking often you're like lost in thought, but there's a certain, you know, level of awareness you can have where you can be mindful of thinking. So you're not distracted by it, but thoughts can come up and you can say like, oh, did I lock the door? But you see the words, oh, did I lock the door? And you're still, there's still this kind of perfect, imperturbable awareness of that being, being just like a smell arising into consciousness. So if you, and then psychedelics really help with that, give you that perspective. So if, yeah, if one just lies back and then um, what kind of watch their mind unravel, which makes it sound maybe less uh, appealing. But um, yeah, like with a high dose psilocybin experience, you know, you might find that as you get to the peak, you know, the mystical experience may only last five, 10 minutes, but as you're getting near the peak, suddenly your kind of your ability to think rationally and, and just speak to yourself in sentences starts to break down. And so you might start, you might just see your mind trying to say like, oh, what was I, what was I thinking? What was, the, what? and it will just kind of say stuff like that until it just gives up. <laughs> and then that's when you just kind of collapse into the present moment um, and it just opens up in this, in this kind of radical way. So for me, yeah, I would say mindfulness was really, um, really crucial in that. And I guess for the therapeutic stuff as well, I would just see what came up and just kind of follow it down with curiosity. So even there, I think I was being just mindful um, and just observing. So yeah, just cultivating the ability to observe and 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 surrender. That's a crucial part. You know, it's intrinsic to observing. Um, if you try and resist, that's that's never going to serve you well in in any of these kind of states. So so yeah, I think meditation is crucial in training yourself to surrender as well. Yeah, definitely that sort of theme of surrender and letting go. Um, it does help, doesn't it? Another thing you, you mentioned in terms of your DMT and your ayahuasca experience, you you know you said about the entities, um, which is you know a common sort of perception of, of people when they have these experiences. I I recently read a thesis by um, si, uh, Simon Bra Brian Harvey Wilson. Um, it's, it's about fifteen years old, and he did a study to look at where the correlation between alien abduction, um, alleged alien mm -hmm. abduction victims and uh, shamanic rituals, you know, the, you know, uh, the ceremonies, the entities that people experience. And one of the things that he sort of came out from that was whether, well, the common denominator was that all the people that were giving the alien abduction accounts were Westerners um, or American and English and, you know, and also a lot of them were for the for the rituals it was kind of tourists you know ayahuasca tourists and what he was sort of aiming at was that we've been sort of drip fed for a long time you know the idea of aliens and those sort of beings in the west and it's it's kind of already there in our in our system when we get to these experiences um Whereas if you, you know, you talk to the tribes and the, the shamanic culture, they have always identified these things as um, star tribes and spirits and other other beings. I, I just sort of, I wondered whether, what your thoughts on that were and whether you thought that this, you know, this, yeah. it, it could be a lot to do with our, you know, our perception and our, the, you know, the imprints that's already there in our, in our minds. Um, setting us yeah, up for these that sounds, that sounds yeah that sounds really interesting does can i clarify if, if the um was the impression that um maybe the experiences were the same in the indigenous people as well but they just use different language or do you think that like there's an active additional experience of aliens that doesn't happen in indigenous people i think they were they were experiencing entities as well but they were more ex okay. because their culture it hasn't really looked at them as as an alien or a, they, they more accepted mm. them as, as spirits that they were right. it was part of their their dna already in their upbringing um yeah and yeah for the west it it's you yeah. know the opposite so yeah because yeah, my my instinct is that these experiences are coming from deep within us in a way that's not 
deeply culturally conditioned, you know, so I, I suspect that um, if you could go inside the mind of, of someone who's been raised in the Amazon and they have an entity encounter and, you know, this is just my my gut instinct with this stuff, I suspect you would look at that and you would say, oh, yeah, that's an alien abduction experience. Like, that's the same yeah. thing. Um, I don't. I, and th I think the reason I say that is because, um, you know, I am have never had any interest in in UFO phenomena. And you know, I discovered last week that I grew up about in one of the local woods near where I grew up. Apparently, is is one of the uh, one of the most famous UFO sightings in, in like world history happened there. I just had no idea because I know that's how <laughs> lacking of interest I am in it. Um, and I should say until now, you know, not to <laughs> sound like I'm I'm really going far out there. But I um, but yeah. So so my first DMT experience suddenly I was lying on a table with about eight of these kind of six foot tall beings examining my body with technology um, and communicating with me telepathically and oddly I felt like I knew them like I recognized them as these things that, that watch over us this was experientially you know I don't I don't it's worth saying actually like wh when I say I don't take it to be kind of literally true I actually don't take anything in the mind to be literally true I think that that's a really fascinating thing when you study the mind you know you realize that that redness, like red apples, aren't actually out there in the world. You know, redness is a construct of, of our minds. The self is an illusion. So it would be crazy to me if it turned out that the contents of psychedelics were literally true, given that I think basically nothing in our, in our experience is literally yeah. true. Yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, so, so I think, um, uh, so one thing is it's astounding. Like it made me realize that abduction phenomena are, in the very least, kind of archetypal human experiences you know something deep inside us that that is, that is being triggered um you know i say at least because i'm sure there's some people who say just yeah would say it's, it's literally true and and you know i have a lot more open mind to, to that now um to those people but uh so yeah i think it's a, a a a deep phenomenon and actually i'm in the middle of writing a paper um which is my take on these experiences not necessarily just the ufo thing but the um Kind of visionary experience in general I, I can't say too much about it to it's published but it, the general sure. thing is is that we've you know we've been talking about mystical experiences which are kind of these unitive states where you realize that you're kind of you could say one with the universe or whatever um and i see that as being completely easy to square with science you know i think it fits better with science than believing in it he goes as these literal things that exist um visionary experiences you know are the kind that DMT produces people have near death, these near death experiences, and also the kind of thing you see a lot in Western Abrahamic religions, you know, kind of interacting with angels and, um, you know, communicating with God, like these, they're very, the, the self and other duality remains intact instead of collapsing as in the mystical experience. And it's very interactive, very emotionally overwhelming, you know, it feels like it's just like love is pouring at you typically. And there are yeah things that are perceived to be alien like aliens, angels, demons, whatever, some kinds of entities, immaterial entities interacting with you. Um, I so th I mentioned before you know how mind blowing it was to me the DMT experience. After processing it and thinking a lot about it, I came down with a with a, a way of squaring it in my mind with a kind of naturalistic worldview where actually it still retains its meaning. And so I guess what I can say is it's like what I've tried to do is kind of um, it's like a kind of biologically and computationally plausible version of Jung's collective unconscious, like a way of thinking about, um, you know, just our deep programming. And so I, I think that it's it's effectively triggering very deep programming. You know, we're a very social species, right? Like it's it shouldn't actually be that surprising that we can imagine interacting with entities because that's what we're doing right now. You know, if you don't if you don't interact with other beings for you know more than a day or two. That should set off alarms that you're probably going to die if you're a human in the wild, you know. Um, so uh, I think I, I think it's triggering basically our, our deep, deep programming. So I actually think the meaning is real. I think the messages people get are real. You know, when they get the message that love is really, really important for us, I think that's true. You know, and that's if you, if you even if you take off the kind of um, the fact that that's a nice thing to think. And you take a kind of cold, you know, headed kind of Darwinian look at things. You go, well, actually, pair bonding through romantic partners and nurturing the young are potentially the two most important behaviors for survival. If you don't mate 
and you don't look after the young, then good luck having passing in your genes, right? So even in that very narrow sense, it's clear that this emotion that we call love is absolutely foundational for us. Um, and so I think even if, so there's a, that's a way I think about this stuff where I think you don't have to believe that um, you encountered beings that have their own independent existence, but you're actually just, yeah, you're getting into your deep programming. And, um, and also it shouldn't be a surprise given that the self, the psychological self isn't everything that you are it it kind of really is coming from outside of yourself you know in these experiences it feels like it's coming from outside of yourself and if you realize that what yourself is is like a little narrative being told by certain parts of your brain suddenly the idea that there are other parts of your organism that can thrust these patterns into consciousness it, it really is coming from outside of yourself and more than that it's actually originating i would say in our deep archaic past it's like kind of echoes of patterns of behavior being passed down through time in our in our kind of organism so to me this is a really kind of a wonderful like i it keeps the enchantment for me it's still i still think like it's not just a hallucination it's not um yeah just a wacky experience that you can say oh it's your brain just doing some scrambled weird stuff but you can say no like there's a there's a way for us to access ancestral wisdom that's kind of that that's worked for our ancestors and and tap into this and, and learn from it um and and for me, it, also, it serves the purpose of making it so that next time I do something like this, I don't have to worry that I'm actually going to be, you know, operated on by aliens that may not have any, you know, uh, my best interests in, at heart. Yeah, yeah. It's inter interesting to think of it in that sort of archetypal sense, like especially even like you say about each other, that if we are all sort of fractalized parts of one being, one thing, we're all kind of masks, you know, our identities are the masks what's to say like you say that the the beings that you know you, you meet on a dmt experience or you know the saints have had experiences with angels and gods and um you know what's to say that it's not the same the same it's archetypal parts of the self um and we are journeying through all those you know archetypal pieces yeah um, like our interaction now what's to say that these are all different you know archetypal things on different frequencies that are happening all the time but um yeah it's really interesting yeah. to think of it like that so. definitely yeah uh, why do you think the the west uh and not just the west why do you think um many parts of the world uh really dislike pl these these plant medicines you know especially you know mm. when you compare them to some of the more dangerous you know, I mean, they're, they're only dangerous, I guess, in the wrong when they're used in the wrong way. Um, but, yeah. Um, but I guess, like you know, the more addictive substances. Why? Why do you think these substances are really kind of disliked yeah. and not approved of? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a good thing to point out, right? That like tobacco has been used very reasonably in in kind of indigenous communities in America without problems. It's only really our our way of using it to soothe unconscious emotional pain that's that's the issue um yeah i i'm fascinated by this this issue and and i i i've been reading a lot around kind of early the formation of early civilization and and i kind of wish that i had training in in anthropology of some kind some kind um because i, I i've yeah i really want a good answer to this this question and my um my feeling is from what i've yeah integrating everything i've seen is that i think there's the dichotomy is between kind of decentralized you know the kinds of um communities we see in indigenous communities where you just have a a, a, a true community interdependent there's no king there's no ruler um and you have mutual support and everyone's kind of deeply embedded and it's like a network that needs to be tightly woven together and regulates itself you know they don't need they don't need rules and and hard laws because if every if you're in a village of 50 people and everyone is your cousin and 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 you're through marriage you you're tied to everyone suddenly you don't need um top down heavy handed control because you're so yeah you know, this is how we evolved right we evolved to be successfully balanced and and i think um i think kind of shamanistic practices are an incredibly advanced technology for balancing 
all of these kinds of psychosocial emotional issues that go on in the community in the individual but yeah and how we interrelate as well so you have that mode of, of being which is which is the vast majority of human history was like that it seems you know it was these communities that managed to balance themselves like that um and then you know you have these kinds of fertile valleys you know a few thousand years ago where suddenly some kind of smart alex start to realize that they can plant a lot of grains you know and agriculture gets invented and suddenly i think you you're faced with this this temptation where you can suddenly you know because i'm not saying it's all rosy being you know in the indigenous communities because you could have famines you could have you know um natural disasters and and there are you know animals that can can eat you but i suspect what it looks like to me is that way of living is a healthy way of living where you, where there are things to fear but you don't have to live with chronic anxiety you know you can you can live generally healthy but then every now and then you need to prepare yourself you know this is the way our emotions are kind of supposed to work mm -hmm. but i feel like what what must have happened is at that point where you have agriculture and you have the possibility to store loads of wealth effectively store loads of food and start to create technology to basically you know put up fences and say well we're we're going to separate off from nature in order to try to control it and regulate it you can see why that would have been incredibly tempting and then as soon but i think as soon as you have that dynamic suddenly you by definition you have inequality in the community because there's a surplus of food so not everyone needs to do the manual labor for the food so by definition like some people are not going to be working and you suddenly well, you know have a rush for whoever's the most powerful presumably is going to start forcing other people you know you know to work for their food that they have i mean we, we take this to be so normal now but imagine it you know you can imagine a sci-fi thing where like imagine if some people managed to kind of get hold of all the oxygen and forced everyone to do their labor for them and then they, they like paid them in oxygen it suddenly <laughs> looks very malevolent and and like you're really enslaving people through this dynamic and i mean that's what we call civilization and i think we then grew in this hierarchical way where you have this stratification and you have power and then top-down control and and propaganda effectively that keeps us trapped in the situation where we're, we're kind of we think this is the right way to be and and we there are benefit there are huge benefits you know in terms of i you know i was about to say i don't have to worry about natural disasters but actually i've moved to portugal where there is a huge wildfire risk thanks to climate change so even that's not true anymore but there are lots of things i don't have to worry about dying from um so so you know you can be there are plenty of reasons to, to think the situation the system is good um but i think the system this system all the way back to the first civilizations it's it's the the game of control fear constant trying to you know it's like in meditation if you're if you're not meditating you might be kind of anxiously worrying about the future ruminating and thinking ahead as opposed to coming into the present and finding well-being i think our culture is stuck in this and since you know civilizations have been stuck in this kind of unconscious thing of like more 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 run away from the trauma run away from you know and the traumas as i said could have been natural disasters or whatever in the first instance but i think we're now in a situation where we have this you know then you start to have wars and generation after generation that all this trauma builds and builds and it becomes incredibly hard for everyone to diffuse it and just come back to being okay in the present moment um so i think to me that's the thing there's this there's a few things like us being us being these animals that have language and hands that can make tools those th those were the kind of the, the things that laid the foundation for us to be able to do this runaway trauma fueled game of, of civilization which we don't see other animals doing <clears throat> and then so so yeah i think that's the fundamental difference and we see this you know in the roman empire they kind of you know took pagan practices and said they were immoral and kind of got rid of you know traditional plant medicine in that way and then the conquistadors and in north america as well they just kind of insisted you know the colonizers just insist it's immoral which is effectively just saying we don't really have a reason you shouldn't be doing it it's not bad for you but we're just going to put this label on it that says it's bad and we have the power so you have to do what you know what we say um so yeah i think that's the the view i have and i i hope that my my like most wildly utopian hopes for the future that's one way of saying it. the other way of saying it is i think the only thing we can do that will save our species in the long run is for mass healing for like mass kind of you know coming to 
everyone individually diffusing their trauma and helping other people to do it so that everyone ha can just be kind of present enough to go like, whoa, like everything got crazy for a minute there. Like, why don't we just collaborate effectively? <laughs> you know, imagine if everyone on earth had their trauma healed and suddenly they're having civil, nice conversations like this, you know, and just willing to collaborate and do things for each other. To me, like that's the, um, that's the solution. Um, and so that's why I do, I think actually plant medicine is the most, is the best bet we have for kind of transforming human organization on earth and having everyone move willingly because it makes sense to them towards a kind of decentralized healthy collaborative free way of being you know like i think effectively i guess i would like to see a kind of global eco anarchism where everyone's completely free of any kind of control but the only way that can work is if the vast majority of people on earth are anarchists effectively in the sense that they are people who are healthy enough to want to collaborate effectively you can't i think that's the beauty actually of you know i mean people get scared by the label anarchism i think because it's again been propagandized against but if you're talking about just decentralized maximum freedom and assume and and believing that equality will arise out of that because everyone's just choosing to collaborate um the, the beautiful thing about that is you can't impose it on people you can't it's not an ideology that you can say they, I'm going to force you to be an anarchist. I'm going to force you to be free and choose to collaborate with me. You know, it just it doesn't work. So, so yeah, I think the only thing we can do is is try to heal everyone to the point where we all, you know, and this is if if it turns out this perspective is right, I'm assuming everyone will see it the same way and go, huh, yeah, let's let's do that. Um, that makes more sense. But you know, if I'm wrong, then something else will happen. <laughs> um, uh, you know, in general, you know what I think you're doing. Uh, in terms of your research and your, your especially your youtube channel you know it's incredible you're you know in the past it's it's really been anthropologists you know like i think i mentioned to you before like michael harner jeremy narby uh rachel harris who i'm reading at the moment you know they've they've tried to to bring science and you know spirituality and plant medicine together and so that it's you know palatable for the you know the, the west and for the rational mind but I think it, it's kind of fallen on deaf ears for a, a long, not not to everyone, but for the majority, it's kind of fallen on deaf ears. And unfortunately, the lens of anthropology, you know, and anthropologists admit this, it is often a problem um, because it's mm. it, it's that other, it's viewing viewing a culture rather than actually experiencing and being part of it. And even going in and experiencing it is not necessarily having the ingrained culture i i wonder for you for your from your perspective you're sort of doing something you know it's almost that's that step up now that you know you've got that really strong you know the scientific background that to to marry that with you know with the spiritual side and with the shamanic side you know i wonder whether that's going to be able to to penetrate you know western brains you know because a bit more because and make it take it to any level because people in this particularly like here in in the uk people really unless it's you know it's if it's got it's solid and it's rational unless it's it's got those foundations people right. everything out everything else is is nonsense and is it they it won't even enter the be considered and i think what you're doing it, it, it i think it i'm hoping that it starts something that people now begin to consider and i'm going to say that irrational instead of irrational like you said start to, <laughs> to start, start to consider that um with, with some some actually you know some decent you know clout and weight behind it and you know you've got the credentials to do that um but the problem i wonder is you know what's how is i think another uh, the same with the anthropologist how is how is it going to be what, how's the problem of making it palatable and accessible to people that don't necessarily have, you know, the the spiritual background or the uh, the academic background? You know, there's lots of language barriers there that um, people may not have a clue what we're talking about. Um, how, how's I think yeah. how's how is that going to be? How is that something that can be overcome? Yeah, I mean, I think came back to what you said at the start of that. I think the um, the fact that these things are, we could, we could say experiential rather than irrational even, um, sorry, 
in the technology that um you could say like if if someone has their own experience you know it doesn't matter what i say you know my i think that's the beauty with the plant medicines um and with meditation as well but you need more guidance there but with plant medicine you can just you know you can have experiences come to your own conclusions and all i'm trying to do is kind of offer a map that i think makes sense that might people might be able to follow um, you know, so I'm not saying this is the way it is. You have to agree with me. It's like if people walk that path and they say, ah, this bit of the map, I think you could improve, then I can I can improve it and integrate it right and just try to help. So so yeah, I think that's that map making process is the way that I, I'm trying to get people to open up to this stuff. Um, but it's really hard, like because I, you know, instinctively felt most of my life that People wouldn't get it if I spoke about the kind of meditative and mystical experience stuff that I'd had. And it was only really when the psychedelics started to, when I realized that they are these unbelievably powerful catalysts for healing and that they've been kept from me and from countless you know, other people and that that's just utterly wrong. And um, that was when I was like, OK, like I need to talk about this stuff. I need to be an advocate for this stuff. Um, and to be honest, I, I felt a lot of distance open up between me and a lot of people I know. Um, and I thought of these people, you know, they know the research, they, you know, um, but even there, you know, I, I felt this happen. And so it made me, it's it, it's not a trivial problem getting people to open up to this stuff. You know, I, I think, um, so, so what I hope is seeing the fact that I can go on and on about this at length and even people in my life don't don't seem to pick up the thread. <laughs> um, I mean, some do, but uh, um, that makes me feel like, again, that what I guess what I'm doing is is a map for once people are, are on the, the path in some way, however they come to it. And I think what's probably going to be the most kind of transformative thing, I'm imagining like five years from now, psilocybin is prescribable, psilocybin assisted therapy is prescribable so that a lot of people with depression can, can go to a clinic where there's kind of, you know, therapists who will guide them through an experience and, you know, and that it will have the kind of incredible effects it's having in clinical trials at the moment. And then everyone will, will have, you know, at least a cousin or even a parent or a sibling who's undergone this. Um, and then the next stage is, is you know, there are lots, very few people are under the illusion that this should be restricted to people with diagnosed mental health conditions. You know, once you have any experience with this, you see how it's helpful for everyone. Uh, well, nearly everyone, you know, if you have issues with psychosis, you know, it might not be for you. But, um, but so I think I can imagine over the coming decades having a situation where it's, it's suddenly just a kind of, because of that first stage of everyone having their, their, it, having it be normalized because it's a medicine for someone they know then thinking oh well, maybe i'll try that um that thing for myself given that there are now these clinics or whatever you know that you can go and do it at um and at that point i'll be able to put look back on 10 years of youtube videos and say i told you so <laughs> to the people <laughs> in my life who aren't interested in it now <laughs> but i uh, know i mean the serious point of that is i, I do genuinely I, I it really excites me the idea that i'm i'm I, I started trying to get onto this stuff as soon as I could, and it, it excites me that I'm, I'm catching the wave at the kind of early stage because I feel like the thing, one of the things that motivates me most is just imagining, you know, imagine just some kind of middle aged mum in England who has never had any interest in this stuff. She has a mind blowing mystical experience on psilocybin because of kind of, you know, depression. And then is like, what the hell? How, how do I make sense of that? And then is just typed into YouTube and then finds there's a whole library of of talking about the science and and you know pointing towards people who are, who deal with emotional healing and all these things and 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 it, that genuinely you know I was joking when I was saying I told you so but the, the kind of nice way of saying that is is it excites yeah. me to think um, that people will be able to find out what I hope will be like a treasure trove of materials uh, that will just will help them make sense of this stuff because. Because if, if you're the only person doing this stuff, it can be alienating. You know, this is why integration groups are really powerful for people, because you can discover what feels like the most important thing you've ever discovered. And then everyone else just looks at you like you've gone a bit weird, you know, and I think that's um, its own kind of painful experience for people. So, yeah, I'm I think we'll be, we'll, we'll reach a critical mass and then suddenly, you know, um, if a quarter of the population 
has realizes that this stuff is what it is i think very quickly pressure on you know our elected representatives would would happen to get it decriminalized and made widely accessible and i think that's the beautiful thing with the mushrooms in particular is i can imagine kind of community centers where you know you have people you know say you you all join up together and pay a minimal fee to pay rent but then you, you if these are decriminalized you will just grow the mushrooms together which is very minimal cost you know it's just a, a plant that can't be a fungus that can't be patented um and then guide each other in these these ceremonies and and integration circles it could be the most cost effective and powerful treatment modality imaginable for a whole range of different different things so that's what i'm hoping once we reach some kind of critical mass that that i think the dominoes could start falling very quickly into some beautiful vision like that yeah no, I, I hope so i really do hope so um, yeah. I, want, I wonder, and I, I think I've said this to other people I've spoke to before, I wonder whether the current state of the world is consciousness almost enforcing its own trauma for a global trauma so that we, uh, we do look in the right direction introspectively and plant medicines. Because, you know, plant medicines, they are coming and psychedelics, they are sort of re-emerging again. And I hope it's not like a, you know, a 1960s kind of phase or... I hope it really is. Yeah. It's a consciousness um, suggesting that we have global trauma. Everyone's got some sort of trauma and we need to, to look at that. Um, I, w yeah. I wondered what your your thoughts were on uh synchronicity um but obviously being a meditator having experienced plant medicine um I, I just wondered if you'd experienced them from your meditations you know and not just synchronicity sort of the the psychic experiences as well whether you'd had anything uh, like that you know like in certain um again philosophies and religions you know you have cities i i wonder if those things had crept into your experience and what you thought what you think they are from again a spiritual perspective and also from what the brain's doing what's the what's the scientific aspect to it yeah i um yeah it's, it's funny because i still have part of me was so kind of comfortable with with the um the, the way that you know this mystical experience squares with nat the natural world and that i I wanted. I would. I will, part of me would have been happier if it was. If it just the story ended there, and and we didn't have TMT and and the weird entities and and all this kind of stuff. I think this comes out of. Um, I think it comes out of both um, the Catholic upbringing, where there was a supernatural stuff that I really pushed back against, um, and also there being kind of psychosis in my family, which has kind of led to me being very wary of of anything that might, you know, be kind of unmoored for or just, yeah. I don't necessarily imply it's definitely on more from reality, but it's like you're starting to play around with what what's really real and you know how do we think about reality and that my personal bias is actually supernatural stuff makes me feel kind of I guess uncomfortable in a, in a way, um, and I'm fascinated because it's because yeah like it's it's there like it's it's like I said with the past life stuff with Tibetan Buddhism, um, part of me thinks. You know, perhaps there's all this stuff they got perfectly right, and perhaps there's this stuff they were just mistaken about, because uh, every culture has its kind of blind spots, whatever. But there's another very strong part of me that thinks that's just some kind of, kind of Western, patronizing, colonizing mentality where it's like, ah, uh, they, they, you know, are just making stuff up. And I respect so much about, you know, these traditions that when they say there are these kinds of cities, as you say, these kinds of mental powers, I think like presumably there's something going on there, and I can't really make sense of it. And I think the um, if they do exist, I you know I I guess the thing that makes me feel most comfortable is to put my scientist hat on and say like the the lack of kind of you know documented proof of levitation or something like that, which is a pretty classic city, you know, um, makes me think like maybe we can just say like you know when people are surrounded by incredibly charismatic people, mm -hmm. our minds play tricks on us, or or even you know like if. Imagine if you've just, I feel like someone like, um, a nice thing with the plant medicines actually is it's allowed me to kind of re-engage with certain aspects of 
the kind of Christian stories and, and really see the value in the kind of archetypal figure of, of, of Jesus. I now get him as a kind of spiritual teacher. I, I feel like I understand the core of that, you know, without all the dogma and stuff. But I imagine if you met Jesus or someone like him, you would, the, them say there's nothing supernatural about it, but it's just so overwhelming to be in the, in basically in the presence of someone enlightened. Um, and it's healing for you to be kind of met with this kind of ultimate compassion and love. Like I can imagine how people would just start, <laughs> in, they'd say to their friends, like, there's this guy, he's amazing. And you're like, well, what's amazing about him? It's like, I, I, he's just really amazing <laughs> and not really be able to, you know, yeah. and then eventually people are like, I don't know, I, I saw him walk on water or just something that kind of, <laughs> so, just something that meets the level of like, this guy's truly amazing. Um, so part of me goes to those kinds of explanations, but, um, but I, I always feel like it's a bit of a cop out because I don't think this whole, you know, as I say, I think people report stuff that, um, I do think there's, there's, in the very least, psychological phenomena to be explained as to why people report this stuff. Um, so, I and and I also think if there is if there if they are literally true and they do happen, um, the only kind of worldview I can make sense of it in would be where you can scrap my my worldview and and it would be one in which reality is just kind of all made of consciousness and it's like I think some interpretations of the kind of Vedas right where it's like this is just some kind of dream and actually the mental is primary the physical well, the physical world is just some reflection of the mental and actually yeah turns out you can do in the same way when you lose a dream you can fly and you can do whatever you want turns out that's the, the character of this world as well so i don't i don't put the chance of that at zero um uh but my particular worldview you know i'm trying to weave it with this kind of naturalistic scientific picture of the world and and i yeah see consciousness as emerging out of the physical rather than that being being the worldview but I will say that I um I've actually had an astounding lack of synchronicities I would say <laughs> I can't really point to any like kind of funny stories of 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 coincidences um but um one thing that happened once um was, was as, as I mentioned all of my trips were very intentional and planned and one time I was like I was I got a bit complacent and instead of having my kind of my music and my headphones and my eye shades i i took the substance and then was um i listened to a podcast for like half an hour just as it was, like, I was like it's not going to come on for a while I'll, I'll listen to this podcast um and it was it was a comedy podcast in which the um there's a person speaking and she she told a joke so it had like a setup and then a punchline and then about 15 minutes later i heard her say the setup again and like as she was saying it I was like why is she repeating that joke i knew the punchline was coming i was like oh she must have just like forgotten that she said it like that's kind of embarrassing you know she said it slightly differently the second time but the audience still laughed you know, generously and then it happened again like with another joke and then i i i got this kind of feeling of like oh no like it feels like it feels like i'm predicting the future or something like it feels yeah. like time is getting I'm getting some weird psychic like visions of the future and so I immediately just turned it off because I was like I'm, I'm again, again like I'm not that's not why I'm here um since then I've, I've been meaning it's, that was you know well over a year ago I've been meaning to go back and try and find that episode and just see maybe she did just repeat two jokes um which seems less well I never, never heard her do it in any other episode so um but yeah I, but even then I I it's in, it's kind of in, in, interesting because it felt so real that it happened in that linear way but having studied psychology and seeing how illusions work and how unbelievably convincing they are i don't it seems very possible to me that my like my brain could have been doing something where i actually didn't hear it the first time but what happened is she started telling a joke and i had some kind of fluctuation in like a um like a kind of certainty signal you know like kind of with deja vu you can imagine you just get this random you know, because your neuro neurochemistry is changing, that the kind of, there's a bit of the brain called the perirhinal cortex, which seems to signal familiarity. So if you're, you know, like, as we're talking, uh, like, that will be increasing its activity. I think it actually might signal it by decreasing its activity. Either way, it changes in one direction or the other. Um, and I suspect that if you, if you turned it up, if, if you kind of suppressed the activity, I wouldn't recognize you anymore. You know, these, this is the kind of way these kinds of things tend to work in the brain. 
So I, I'm open to the idea that basically she was telling a joke. My parental cortex went a bit crazy because of all the chemicals. And I had this feeling of I've heard this joke before, you know, and it, it all happens so fast that, you know, you 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 fill in the memory and it, and it seems like this perfect narrative. Oh, and like to, saying that to myself, it seems implausible because it felt so linear. It felt like I heard the joke, time passed, I heard it again, happened again. Um, but I don't rule out the idea that that can happen, um, given that, as I said, like I think of our perception of the world as a kind of controlled hallucination where it's this very creative weaving together of all this stuff into this this reality that seems very real. Um, but that's not really kind of this isn't really what reality looks like. You know, it doesn't actually have an appearance, I would say. Um, you know, that's just our consciousness is like a projection of what it what it could look like. Um, and you know, that's kind of what being conscious is, is to 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 come up with to invent appearances for the world that doesn't actually have any appearances. Um, yeah, so I think uh, that's that's probably where I'm at with it, but I'm, I'm excited to see where I go with this um, in the future, because I suspect there are. I suspect there are things that Western science currently dismisses that will turn out to be, you know, true. And um, I don't want to. I don't yeah, usually wait on this because I don't want to be the kind of the skeptic scientist who just says there's probably some, you know, uninteresting explanation. And I, I like my explanations to, you know, I feel like it's very rare for meaning to be misplaced. It can happen, you know, especially with psychedelics. You can just um, you know, with paranoia or you can come up with kind of false stories. But generally meaning it's kind of like it caches itself really like if something's meaningful it's meaning and it's like meaningful in its own terms so when something like the dmt experience is meaningful or when the mystical experience is meaningful i tend to think it's showing you something really important about reality whether that's something about ourselves or about the wider reality so so yeah when it comes to if someone was to say to me what's happening with levitation i don't want to just say ah, oh, it's you know, made up or whatever <laughs> um, that doesn't tend to be the way i like to explain things yeah no, fantastic Obviously, you're a you know practicing um, meditator, um, you know which you know involves you know negating of thoughts and you know introspection and things like that, um, and obviously you know breath you know retention of breath, slowing the breathing down. What, how does that as a, as, a, as from your scientist background, scientific background, how does how does that meditation affect the brain? What does what are the what are the things that change and you know, create that state that allows you to be in that nice, tranquil place. Yeah, so I'd say for me, for most of my life, the kind of meditation I practiced was it's it's closest to a kind of Tibetan form of meditation. These teachings called Dzogchen, which is very um, it's like rather than negating, it's like every, it's, it's all inclusive effectively. And it's kind of like resting in awareness or awareness of awareness or Krishnamurti called it choiceless awareness, where there's just there's just kind of existence appearing in consciousness and thoughts may come, everything may come, but it's all just this kind of play happening in, in this kind of illuminated space of consciousness. Um, and that's quite a, that can be a bit of a disembodied feeling that you're kind of, you're identifying with consciousness or even beyond that, you're just identifying with existence. Um, once I, did the kind of trauma work and, and healing work, I started to really feel the value in, you know, meditation, people would do like body scans and, and those kinds of meditations. And so in the first kind, I wouldn't be trying to control my breath. I wouldn't be trying to do anything, just just witnessing. Um, but in the second kind, you're more actively engaging with your physiology. Um, and I think that's really powerful. Um, yeah, for kind of coming to an embodied way of, of dealing with this stuff. Um, and so in the first instance, what you're doing is you're kind of dropping your sense of self. And so there's, you know, if 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 I were to do it now, um, I look at my hands, there's this feeling of they're just being actually, instead of this being inside me and everything else being outside me, there's a kind of continuous just display of, of visual inputs, of just of, of visual appearance. It's a bit like looking at a, a, a film being projected on a wall and being immersed in the film and thinking you're 
you know seeing this this person run down a, run down a street perhaps and then suddenly you, you can kind of toggle your perception and say well actually there's just a play of light on the wall that person isn't actually separate to the street it's all just a flat two-dimensional display you can do that as well with awareness you can kind of realize it's just a display in this kind of sphere of consciousness um and so when you drop your sense of self that's associated with reduction in a network of brain areas that's been called the default mode network because it's the kind of the default mode you tend to be in is is um when you see these areas activated so you put someone in a brain scanner tell them not to do anything they'll probably their mind will start wondering if they're not a meditator um and or even, even if they are and they're not meditating you know you just think about you know of oh, you know this this uh, scanner is noisy. What am I going to do tomorrow? When's lunch? What time is it? All those kinds of thoughts. You're, it's highly structured with a sense of being the thinker, thinking the thoughts. And so all of that way of being is tied up with this illusion of, of the self. So in moments of kind of successful meditation, there tends to be a reduction in blood flow to those areas, which is correlated with less glucose going to the neurons, less activity in the neurons because they use glucose as their energy. Um, and so that's the kind of the classic finding from kind of meditation science and it's also been replicated with ego death or mystical experience states in psychedelics as well so, so there's a real real parallel there um but then when it comes to the more subtle um you know engaging in as you say slowed breathing and um maybe a body scan there there's a far more complex array of things going on to do with your autonomic nervous system which is a kind of You've got the central nervous system, you have the spine and the brain inside the skull, and then the peripheral nervous system outside. Um, and part of that is this kind of largely unconscious, uh, you know, thing called the autonomic nervous system involved in kind of fight and flight. But also there's another part that people often call rest and digest. Um, and so it kind of toggles you into a state of, um, yeah, as you say, relaxation, which might sound to a lot of people, if you talk about stress and relaxation, it can sound a bit trivial, but actually as organisms, those two modes are absolutely fundamental for any organism. Like whether they're, you know, whether we have kind of cortisol and adrenaline rushing through our system, or if we're not doing that and we're recovering, there are profound differences in our, in our body and in our mind. Um, so, so that's a huge, I would say that's the most, one of the most important parts of what's going on. You're getting this far more with, with the kind of, you know, relaxing body scan type. It doesn't have to be body scan, but if you're, just, as you say, slowing your breathing and getting into a tranquil state, um, you're training your whole organism really to inhabit a space of health more often than in a state of kind of activation. Um, and yeah, this, if you, for most people, you kind of take wherever you are on that spectrum as normal, and you might try and relax for five minutes and they may not have much of an effect. And you may think, well, relaxation is, doesn't do much for me. And, you know, being a bit stressed is fine. I'm usually stressed anyway, you know, that kind of way of being. But with psychedelics, you can you can really start to explore the spectrum and realize what it feels like to be so relaxed and so open that you have these deeply spiritual experiences of feeling yourself to not be separate to the rest of the universe. Um, and suddenly then it's like, oh, OK, now I see the value in deep relaxation, moving myself over this territory it's like you get a bird's eye view of the landscape and now suddenly you can move towards towards profound health both physiologically and psychologically um and you know there's been a kind of swathe of books um over the past few years you know especially the work of like gabo mate who talks about kind of the, the the cost of stress in the body you know if you live in a in a mode where you're unconsciously you have these stress hormones raging and you have muscle tension you can just you can get all variety of health issues um and I think a, a huge amount of the kind of burden of healthcare at the moment comes from these kinds of psychosomatic issues. The fact that we live in a culture that doesn't value shifting into this kind of this this relaxed way of of, of being, you know, um, it's, it's interesting being at conferences um, on psychedelics. It's very <laughs> quite a few of the kind of elders in the field, you know, hit like 100 or are still giving talks like 90 odd. Um, and I've heard a few of them kind of joke about like that there's probably something to hitting your serotonin system every now and then, yeah, you know, as you do with a psychedelic that kind of shakes you out of your rut on this kind of spectrum of, of the kind of autonomic nervous system um, that can be incredibly good for health. So yeah, as we said at the start, like, I mean, far from being bad for you, these things can be really health promoting in all, in all senses, I think. 
Yeah, and it's it's interesting what you said there about glucose, um, and you know that it it makes things like fasting make a lot of sense to when people you know and reach these states. But also, when you're talking about health, when you think about how much sugar is in our culture, how you know I I can imagine even the best of meditators if they've got a high sugar diet, it's going to be even harder for them to reach those states. Um, so it's really interesting yeah. what you say about that and glucose being a something that affects the way that we can relax and meditate. Um, yeah, and also why breath work is can be so powerful. You know, with with breath work, if you breathe deeply, you can very quickly alter the chemistry of your of your blood, which also the chemistry of your brain. And you know, people report report incredible kind of DMT like experiences just from breathing rapidly and kind of holotropic breath work. So um, yeah, it's um, it often takes the powerful plant medicine to kind of again like show people the territory because if you say to you and me right now oh if you do a kind of guided relaxation meditation it'll be really good for you or um if you breathe fast you'll you'll have the most psychedelic experience of your life it just doesn't seem to it seems like a lot it seems like a trivial thing you you're doing that has this is claim that it's going to have this really disproportionate effect um but then once you've seen the kind of landscape, you see, you get the logic of it and you can start to really trust in those processes. It's hard to kind of do them right, I think, if you don't believe in them. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's fascinating that we kind of tend to have a lot of this capability within ourselves anyway, within our basic diet, our, you know, the way we, we engage with our bodies. Um, and, yeah, that's something that's great about these things. You can end up basically realising you don't really need them that much at all yeah. in the end. One of, the, one of the synchronicities I had when I was sort of doing a bit of research um, about yourself and what you're doing, um, I when I came across your, your homestead project that you're working on, um, which sounds amazing, by the way, um, that was one of the things that, it, I, when I think I heard you talking about it on another channel, um, and it's something my wife and I have debated many times in the last year in a similar sense and it, it was a, a synchronicity for me to hear that you're you know you, you're out there and you're doing it and it sounds you know it's there's a um a guru sort of teacher i listened to um at the sat yoga institute in costa rica um and he often emphasizes that the state of the world at the moment is like an end of a cycle uh, sort of kali yuga type thing um and he but he says, you know, there's this new new cycle that's going to begin, this new way of living, um, you know, a new way of understanding the world. When, when I hear that that's what you're doing, um, it kind of sounds like that's that's that kind of is sounds like the tip of that, you know, that new cycle at the beginning of that. You know, what what can you, you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, I'm flattered to to hear that that I could be part of something on that grander scale. And you know, in my more optimistic moments, I really hope that is what we're we're both part of right now. Even you know, having these conversations. Um, yeah, I think this um, is something I've been thinking about as well. Is is the idea that what I've seen again and again? You know, I mentioned how it can be dispiriting how few people are willing to follow you on this on this path. Um, you know, no matter how much you go on about it. Um, and uh, I think what I've seen again and again in people's psychology is that I think people really need to bottom out, well, not everyone, but a lot of people really need to hit rock bottom um, in the, their current mode before they're willing to shake things up and try something new. Um, and people can be really almost at rock bottom, but still be unwilling to change until they they literally have nowhere lower to go and then they look around and they go okay like someone needs to point me in a new direction because i can't go any further in this direction um i worry uh, that that could be what needs what the kind of dynamic that plays out at the social scale as well and that the kinds of crises that are happening right now and that are kind of on the horizon are that you know we talk about averting them but i i worry that basically human psychology is such that we won't do anything until we're like we've we've made absolutely certain 
that this game of civilization that gives us all these fun toys um isn't you know we may, you know we just want to make sure there isn't, there isn't a little tweak we can do that makes it all fine um before we we move to something radically different um so that's that's my concern but i guess there's there is hope that i think it's as as much damage as we're doing i think it's unlikely that um it will be kind of completely game over for, for especially for life on earth i think you know if you identify as just if you if you start to kind of identify more with just life and other living beings then um then that can be reassuring although you don't want to i personally don't want to lose my uh deep compassion for other humans you know become an anti-humanist of, of some kind um i think that's uh you know is that's part of the kind of relative truth thing i mentioned earlier is um you might realize that you are, you know, in absolute terms, you are just part of existence, or maybe you're, you know, you say you're a bit of life, and so you're you're as compassionate to the rest of nature as you are to yourself. But then ultimately, I think the relative truth of I am a human, and with my own human biases, that I actually I do care about humans more than I care about other animals, even though that may not be objectively true, that that we are more valuable. You know, I think it's worth living from a place where you're not trying to deny your nature. You know, so, so, um, so yeah, that that's just clarifying my, I guess, catastrophic visions of the future of what could what could happen. Um, but yeah, I think um, the good thing is is with with the kind of plant medicine stuff is that they they're the hope we have that we don't need to wait until it gets to that point. You know, if enough people. Um, you know, there are there are enough people who are really at their wits end with, you know, treatment resistant depression and a whole bunch of mental health issues who would adopt these medicines, I think. Um, and perhaps, yeah, once we get some critical mass, that will be the the thing that really accelerates an upswing. That, that means we don't have to get to a real crisis point uh, before we're willing to to do something different. Um, yeah, that's my, my take on that. Yeah. And just for, for those that are sort of seeing it, this for the first time how would you describe um this the project that you're you know looking to set up um yeah so we've been out here for it's coming up to a year now it's gone by fast it's time flies when there's a pandemic um and uh yeah we're so we, we bought a big bit of land in southern portugal um we're currently towards the end of renovating a lovely farmhouse that we have here um living in a tent in the meantime um and we did it because we knew we wanted to kind of live close to nature and we wanted to try to free ourselves from the kind of the usual way of, of having to kind of live in a city and and have a normal kind of work, work life. Um, and we've both been very fortunate to be able to make to, to pull it off that we've, you know, got to a point where we've managed to, you know, with the Internet now, I'm optimistic lots of people could do this if they wanted to with remote working. Um, and so that was the first intention. Um, my wife's always had a vision of of doing an artist residency, so where artists of all kinds can come and stay for a while, and just to have kinds of um, all kinds of art supplies and and methods available. My side of it is, um, I would like to do meditation retreats. I've um, been doing, I've kind of been qualified as a, a meditation teacher, so um, I would like to offer those at some point um, once the pandemic's over properly. Uh, we're also talking. Uh, with uh with some people about running ayahuasca retreats here as well um with actual peruvian shaman not not trying to do it in some kind of neo-shamanic uh way you know um and yeah so all of this is in in the works but it all it all kind of happened just because we knew we wanted to be out here doing something that we could offer to people just have a kind of bit of a sanctuary where um people can come and spend time um and yeah, I mean, even if people just kind of come and maybe help out with projects and kind of camp on the land or whatever. Uh, so it, it's not a, um, it's not like uh, we're not, you know, we're not doing it like uh, there's a strict business model and we're going to be doing ayahuasca retreats a year from now or we're going to be doing meditation retreats. And uh, but it's a, it's a way of living that we're experimenting with that makes sense for us that we we hope will, will turn into something really beautiful that people can come and check out. And I think if people are interested. The surrender homestead on instagram tends to be the best place to to follow what we're up to great oh, fantastic no, thank you very much i um 
yeah, I've really enjoyed talking to you. I, I really appreciate you taking the time to to have a chat with me. It's, you know, some really interesting stuff there. Um, yeah, I've really enjoyed it. Thanks. It's been great. <laughs>